My presentation here today is entitled Duress, Dissidence, and Deadly Force. And I just want to take a moment to ask people to put themselves in uh, a state of mind to really uh, be prepared to hear some heavy information in this presentation. It's going to be tough for some people to hear some of the things I'm going to say today. Um, so this is not done lightly. This is, uh, should be received with a somber state of mind and a sobering state of mind. And there are cer certain things I'm going to talk about that some people don't even want to envision. However, we have to consider them and uh, hold them in our psychological makeup as potentialities. They're potentialities I don't want to see manifest in the world, never have. But we have to be prepared that they may manifest. So with that being said, let's jump into the topic. I dedicate this presentation in its entirety to the memory of Samuel Adams. Samuel Adams, perhaps more than anybody else, is uh, the person that I historically, personally identify with because perhaps single-handedly, this man began the American Revolution. He was probably the most influential soul of that time period as far as bringing people to action. He exercised the call to action more than anyone else. He was called by the British the chief conspirator. As a matter of fact, the American Revolution was referred to by some people in England and some of the Tories in America as the Adams Conspiracy. John Adams, uh, when he traveled to Europe, was often asked, especially when he went to France, are you the famous Adams? And he had to respond, no, I'm not. That's Samuel Adams. So Samuel Adams said, the truth is all might be free if they valued freedom and defended it as they ought. Truth has to be, freedom has to be valued and defended. And that is why we're in the situation that we are in as a people, because truth isn't valued and defended enough. So this presentation is not for very young people, not for children, and it's certainly not for the easily offended. So if you have that sensibility about you, uh, now's the time to leave. Uh, I think no one here ha will, will be easily offended. I think you know we're all in the room because we recognize uh, the information uh, that I'm about to speak here today is vitally important to understand. So this is the caveat I always give. It's certainly not for the people in this room, but it may certainly be for the people who listen online or on YouTube or on my website or wherever this presentation is going to be going to reach their eyes and ears. My presentation style can be very intense. It can be harsh. It can even be combative. I don't sugarcoat my words or delivery. Some people are likely to become upset or angered at what I'm going to say during this presentation. And I say, go right ahead and get as offended as you like. Okay, that will never make what I'm about to say untrue because truth by its very nature is uh, belligerent. It wages war against deception and mind control. I don't present this information to be liked. So, uh, believe me, if I wanted to present information to be liked, I'd be blowing smoke up people's rear end and telling them everything was fine and they're doing just fine and everything's going to be okay. Uh, I tell people very uncomfortable realities and a lot of people don't like that. So, you know, I may be popular among some of the people in this room, but that's not necessarily the case when it comes to the wider body of humanity for sure. I speak publicly because I recognize that in the crisis that we're in right now, I have a moral obligation to communicate what I know to be taking place in our world to other people to help them to understand it as well so they, they can take action and do something about it. This is a call to action, ladies and gentlemen. And the bad news is this is still the mindset of the vast majority of humanity. And that's the, that's the best image that I could find to sum up what I think of the human mindset in the aggregate. It certainly doesn't apply to the people in this room, as I've said, but this is where Earth is at. The people of Earth 
are right there. Firmly right there. Okay? And they need to uh, extricate themselves from that position. And uh, otherwise, we're going to be coming down to this very serious consequences I'm going to be talking about. Manly P. Hall said that it is not the wrath of the Almighty, but the stupidity of man that is causing all the trouble. And if people are not familiar with this man's work, I mean, you need to become so, because he was absolutely a brilliant philosopher, an occultist, a deocultist, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, he has some of the best work uh, that I've ever taken in that really helped to open up my mind and wake me up. This is the human condition, ladies and gentlemen. The human condition, whether anyone has recognized it or not, or accepted it or not, is slavery. And see, I'm not going to sugarcoat words. Never have, never will. I'm going to come out and say it just as it is in plain language, regardless of who likes it or not. The, the whole idea of true spirituality the whole goal of true spirituality is the ending of the human condition called slavery. It's never been okay. It's not okay now. It never will be okay. It's completely immoral. And the people who continue to perform the actions that hold the human condition in this state or support and condone those actions are immoral people. And we are the people who need to reach out to those people that can be helped and change their mindset. That's what the great work is. People will say, well, there's many, many, many paths to freedom and spirituality. But I, I will, I'll take umbrage with that statement. There are many paths that can get you to an understanding of what the solution is. But there's only one real, true solution. And this can sound dogmatic to people. It can even sound religious to people. And I try to explain to people in all my work, I'm not dogmatic, I'm not religious, to say something to the effect of, do you believe in natural law or do you think it's some type of religious dogma is as ridiculous as asking someone if they believe, believe, if I hold an object up and then let it go, will it fall downward? There is no dogma or religious belief required for that. It's law in the universe. Well, behavior is also bound by law. This is the problem with the human ego, though. The human ego refuses to accept that behavior is bound by law. And we want to think we can do anything we want as long as we don't get caught. The only solution is the understanding of natural law and how we are inextricably forever bound by it. We, can have, we have free will to choose our behavior, but we do not ha have free will to be insulated from the consequences of our choices in free will. Natural law is the most occulted information that needs to be understood by humanity, and there is very little progress in propagating a worldwide understanding of natural law to the body of humanity. That's what our work is, folks. That's what the work of the people in this room and the people who do understand this listening out there on the internet is. We have to become teachers of this information. I naively thought in my early days of doing this that there would be at least a million to 10 million teachers of natural law in the world by this point after doing this for a decade. And I can count them on two hands. The good ones, the ones who are doing it effectively. You know, it's not, our efforts are not enough. That's the thing that I want to convey to the people in this room and listening who do understand my work. The effort has to be advanced and stepped up. We need to become teachers of this information to everyone within earshot of our voices or humanity is going to go down the path I'm going to talk about, which is going to be very, very, very ugly. Natural law is a set of universal, inherent, objective, non-man-made, eternal, and immutable conditions which govern the consequences of behaviors of beings with the capacity for understanding the difference between harmful and non-harmful behavior. That means it applies to intelligent beings who have a developed brain and, and nervous system like we do. 
okay? It doesn't apply to lesser beings, to the animal kingdom. They don't, they're, they're not going to sit there and reason. We have the capacity for reason. They're instinctual creatures. They have emotions as well. But we have higher thought functions. That's why natural law applies to us. The behavioral laws of creation apply to humans and more advanced beings. Because we have the capacity for understanding morality. A worldwide common sense understanding of true objective morality and the laws that govern behavioral consequence is the only true solution to the current human condition of slavery. For as long as humanity remains ignorant of the occulted knowledge of natural law, it will remain enslaved. And that is by law. By universal cosmic law. By no laws of man will remain enslaved, it will be enslaved by the laws of creation. For those who are not familiar with my work regarding natural law, I absolutely encourage everyone to watch my three-part video series called Natural Law, The Real Law of Attraction and How to Apply It in Your Life. That's for free on my website in the videos section, or you can get a hard copy here, you can get a hard copy on my gifts area of my website. What natural law is all about is the objective difference between right behavior and wrong behavior. I always tell people that, you know, we use the, the same word to communicate the idea of correct and moral. We use the word right to communicate that, those concepts. Correct means based in truth. And moral means that it is in harmony with natural law principles because when you take a right action, the result of that action does not result in harm to other beings, to other sentient beings. Conversely, wrong behavior is both incorrect and immoral. Incorrect meaning it is not based in truth and immoral meaning it is in opposition to natural law because when we take wrong behaviors, someone is harmed as a result of that behavior, of that behavioral choice. The problem is, folks, most people still in the year 2018, sad as though, though it may be to say, cannot properly define a right. They cannot give you the definition of what a right behavior is. And that's why we're losing our rights. Because they do not understand that a right is an action that does not cause harm to another sentient being. And it, it, that is the definition, and it is as simple as that. You know, I've rewatched the movie k -Pax recently. And the, you know, it's about an alien being that comes to the earth and interacts with you know, the primitive human beings that can't understand his mindset. And when he's asked if his, his uh, planet has a government, he says, we have no need for a government. And he's like, well, how, how do your people know right from wrong? And his answer is, every being in the universe knows the difference between right and wrong. That's the real answer to that question. This is, should be common sense knowledge, but we're so backwards as a species that I need a nine hour presentation to explain to brainwashed people what the difference between right and wrong behavior is. You know, I, I've said in past presentations, sometimes I sit up at night and laugh at the ridiculousness of what I do. Really, I laugh at how ridiculous having to present basic information like this is. And yet the majority of human beings, it's falling on deaf ears. The following actions are examples of the initiation of aggression against others, which is what all wrongdoings are. These actions are violations against natural rights and therefore constitute violence. Murder, assault, rape, theft, trespass, and coercion. And you could think all you want about any wrongdoing that can possibly be committed. I've challenged many, many people to do this, and you will recognize every single wrongdoing that can be committed against another human being is a form of theft. There is only one wrong, theft, in one form or another, and there is only one law in the universe. Don't steal. That's it. Every wrongdoing comes down to an act of theft. Provably. Murder is the taking without just cause of the life of another, which does not belong to you. Assault is the taking without just cause of another, physical's, uh, uh, another, another being's physical well-being, which does not belong to you. Rape is the taking of another's free will sexual consent, which does not belong to you. Theft is the taking of property 
physical property which does not belong to you. Trespass is the taking of the security of another person in their domain, in their dwelling place, which does not belong to you to take. Coercion is the taking of another being's free will, which does not belong to you to take. Every wrongdoing is a form of theft. There is no wrongdoing anyone can think of that is not a form of theft. Natural law versus man's law. Natural law is based upon principles and truth which are inherent to creation. Man's law is based upon dogmatic belief systems which are the constructs of, of a diseased mind. Natural law is only ever harmonized with due to knowledge and understanding or not harmonized with, with due to ignorance. Man's law, on the other hand, is only complied with due to fear of punishment. Natural law is universal. It exists and applies anywhere in the universe regardless of location. Man's law differs with location based upon the whim of the legislators who are making up these decrees and commands. And that is a form of moral relativism. The idea that we can decide what right and wrong are, that they are not objective and inherent to creation because they are based upon actions. Natural law is eternal and immutable. That means it exists and applies for as long as the universe exists and it cannot ever be changed by any action that any being within the universe can do. Man's law, on the other hand, changes with time based upon the whim of legislators, which is also moral relativism. If a man-made law is in harmony with natural law, it follows logically that it is redundant, since it is stating a truth that is inherent, pre-existing, eternal, and self-evident, or it should be self-evident. Therefore, man's law is both irrelevant and unnecessary. If a man-made law is in opposition to natural law, it follows logically that it is both false, meaning it is incorrect, and it is immoral, meaning it is harmful, it results in harm to other beings. Or in other words, it's wrong. Therefore, a man's law can, uh, that is in opposition to natural law cannot, can never be legitimately binding upon anyone. Therefore, I say throw all of man's law out. We don't need it. We only need to understand and bring our behavior into compliance with natural law. That's it. And then we would experience a society based in freedom. Because as we engage in moral behavior, a, a society in the aggregate becomes more free. And as we be engage in immoral behavior, a society in the aggregate becomes more enslaved. That is the natural law of freedom. There is a law that governs the freedom of a whole society. As morality increases, freedom increases. As morality declines, freedom declines. There's only one true divide in all of humanity. Only one thing that really separates human beings into two groups. This is what I call the true dialectic or the true divide. There's only one divide that separates humanity into two distinct types of individuals. The criterion for this divide is whether or not an individual believes in the concept of authority and therefore believes that there is legitimacy to slavery. Because that is what authority is. That is what the belief in authority is. It is the belief in the legitimacy of slavery. The only, two, the only difference between human beings is whether they are a statist or an anarchist. There is no other difference. And I don't mean like characteristics and personality. I'm talking about things that actually, truly, truly separate us into two camps of beings. The statist says he has the brilliant idea that we give a small group of people the right to kidnap, imprison, harass, steal from, and kill people so that we can be protected from people who kidnap, harass, steal from, and kill people. Brilliant, brilliant ideology. It's working out so well, don't you think? Our rights are protected, we're prosperous, you know, we're free. It's, it's just, it's, it's just a, a flawless idea that's working out wonderfully. 
You know, I was looking, I have told this anecdote in the past, I was looking for a picture of an anarchist, and you're not going to see any pictures of people in the quote-unquote anarchist movement. I'm not going to single out anybody, uh, least of all myself, to put a picture and say they're the quintessential anarchist. You know, so I was going through images and I found this meme with Jesus as the anarchist saying, I'm an anarchist, but most of my followers are statists. And nothing could be more true. The, the fake-ass Christian religionists that all believe in the authority of government and have this, uh, you know, uh, dissonance in their mind that somehow, uh, you know, God could be an authority uh, bringing the laws of behavior and, and, and the universe upon people. And yet we can still have authority vested in man, you know. This idea of serving two masters. A statist is an individual who erroneously believes that there is such a thing as authority vested in certain human beings, which magically gives them the right to rule over other people. This, quote, authority means that certain people who we call government, the masters, have the moral right, quote unquote, to issue commands to those whom they rule, and those under their, quote, jurisdiction, which literally means the law is what I say it is literally in its etymological roots. These people are their slaves who have a moral obligation to obey the arbitrary dictates, the laws set by their masters. And most simply put, when we really strip away all the euphemism, a statist is simply someone who believes in the legitimacy of slavery. And that makes them by definition immoral. Conversely, an anarchist is one who knows that there could never be legitimacy to authority or government because those terms are simply euphemisms for coercion, violence, and slavery, which are always immoral and therefore are always in opposition to natural law, the universal, spiritual, moral laws of creation. The problem is people don't understand the meaning of true anarchy. I'm not talking about, you know, people who call themselves anarchists, folks. You know, when I'm using the term anarchy here, I'm talking about true anarchy and true anarchists. And there's only one real kind of anarchist, and that is the anarchist that understands all authority, all government is slavery, and the only solution is moral behavior under natural law. That's what an anarchist really is. The word anarchy comes from the Greek prefix an, meaning without, the absence of, and the Greek noun archon, meaning master or ruler. Anarchy does not mean without rules. It does not mean chaos. It does not mean disorder. It does not mean, quote unquote, lawlessness when it comes to moral law. It literally means without rulers, without masters, and archon, without masters, meaning no masters, no slaves. And if you say the phrase no masters, no slaves to the average person, and you say word association game, tell me the first word that comes to your mind when I say no masters, no slaves, they'll say freedom. But I just gave you the etymological meaning of a word from its root languages, from its root language, and the word literally means without masters. And yet people think it means chaos and lawlessness and disorder instead of what it really means, freedom. That is what the word anarchy actually means by its very definition. So we have to understand the, the solution is living in a society, in a state of existence where we don't have a master class and a slave class, a ruling class and a ruled class. All of us are already ruled by natural law and we need to simply bring our behaviors into alignment with those laws by thinking, feeling, and doing what is right. Yet this is the perpetual continued human condition of slavery and we haven't we have had this kind of slavery in this very country hard ball and chain whip and murder full physical enslavement of human beings right here in this country part of what uh, th this kind of forced labor was used to build a lot of the infrastructure of this country. 
We are not in the state right now where we have this kind of slavery taking place all around us, but we're going to move toward it again. We're going to move toward it again as a karmic consequence of what we allowed here and a karmic consequence of as an aggregate people of allowing the soft form of slavery called government to continue because it is never going to stop its march toward total totalitarianism unless we morally straighten up and educate everyone regarding moral principles that, and that slavery in any form is wrong no matter how you euphemize it. So this is the continuing human condition and the great work is to end that condition. That is what the great work is and that's why so few people want any part of it. Because it's not the lighthearted little party. It's the one great work. Just, just to tell people, not, not that it matters because, you know what, too many people are focused on dollar signs and value being only in monetary units. But just to tell people, just so you have an idea of the kind of financial situation I have foregone to do this work. I actually sat one day and calculated the amount of money that all of the work that I've ever done in What on Earth is Happening by man hours and the type of work that it is, I calculated the going rates and the amount of man hours that I have done in What on Earth is Happening. You want to take a guess of how much money I would have made if I would have been paid to do the type of technological work that I've done with What on Earth is Happening? $330. Try again, sir. $500. Try again. $500. Way higher. $1,000,000. Way higher. $3,000,000. Five million dollars. I made thirteen thousand dollars last year on what on earth is happening work. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, seriously, like no one should really clap about that. You know, like, like I, I certainly probably should have made the former number instead of the latter one. Okay, because but what we do is we reward basketball players and football players and you know pop music artists you know that's what we reward and and put up on a pedestal and reward financially because that's what the people of this world find value in people come up to me all the time mark why aren't you doing way better why are you living like you're living why are, why are you living so meagerly you know because that's how much people have valued this work in the world and I don't, I don't do this for monetary value. I could care less. I'm going to continue to do this if it costs me money to do it, which it did initially in the initial years. You know? So that's not my motivating factor. My motivating factor is to end this condition. Too many people have this idea of I have to be rewarded financially to do this. I liken it to somebody standing in a war ditch while the enemy is raining fire down upon them and, and people are saying, here, take this weapon, fire back, and they're going, pay me first. <laughs> it's that ridiculous. But it's just something that I wanted to say about what people find value in and what they don't find value in. And that's part of the problem. Slavery is a claim of ownership on your person, the product of your labor or your possessions in whole or in part. All natural rights are property rights. Understood properly, all rights are property rights because all wrongdoing is theft. It's the taking of some form of property. Understanding this fundamental, understanding this is fundamental to understanding the condition of slavery. We all own ourselves and have the right to live freely and exercise our natural rights provided actions we perform do not infringe upon another person's rights. Anyone who dares to try to stop people from living within these natural rights is making a direct claim of ownership upon that other being, which is the very definition of slavery. Those who do this or condone this are tyrants and should be treated as such. This is no light matter, ladies and gentlemen. That's why I told you, get into a somber, serious mindset about the topics I'm going to talk about and discuss today because this is extremely serious and should be taken as such. 
The people who are doing what they are doing have no right to do these coercive and immoral behaviors and conduct them upon the human population. And we have every right to end that state. And ladies and gentlemen, get as offended by this next statement and slide all you want, but here are the enforcers of slavery in the modern world. The police and the military are the enforcers of slavery. I don't care who you know that's in the police or military. I don't care who you like that's in the police or military. I don't care what kind of relationship you have with people that are in the police and military. I will look any member of the police and military in the eyes directly to their face and tell them that they are the enforcer of worldwide slavery. Because that is the truth. They work for the interests of the ruling class and the dictates of the ruling class. Period. The end. And until these people walk away from their immoral jobs, humanity is going to remain enslaved or it's going to take something that is going to be extremely negative and ugly for everyone to end the condition of slavery, which I don't want to see it come to. The great work is to get these people to quit their cult. That's what the great work is. It's to get people to quit this, these cults, because that's what they are, are cults. They're satanic cults. And to get the people who condone these cults to stop condoning the behaviors of these cults. If you're not familiar with my work on order followers, which is what these people are, that's why they do what they do. They don't want to think for themselves. They don't want to reason right and wrong for themselves. They want to listen to what other people tell them to do and then just do it because that's a cop out and an easy answer and they think that that somehow absolves them of their personal responsibility and moral culpability. I put out this a few years back called The Cult of Ultimate Evil, Order Followers and the Destruction of the Sacred Feminine, which is the true heart-based care energy within all of us, which gets murdered in these cult members so that they can go out and perform the behaviors that they perform like the automaton robots that they are. So this is another critical video for people to take in and understand the concepts in it. The police and the military are the modern equivalent of house slaves of the Civil War era period. They are the people who are keeping the system of slavery in place. And they do this through duress, which is the first part of the three parts of this presentation. Duress, dissidence and deadly force. Part of the problem in the non-recognition of the human condition of slavery is people, most people, do not understand what the condition of duress is and why it is so immoral to conduct upon anyone. I'm going to explain what duress is. And these enforcers of slavery are continuously conducting duress upon other beings. And they have no natural right to perform duress and keep other people in a state of duress. And the people who are under this state of harass, duress have every right to end it by whatever means they choose to end it. They have the right. Now, see, I want to make it clear today. I'm not suggesting a direct course of action to anyone. I'm just trying to explain to you what your natural rights are to do. You might be perfectly within your natural law right to take a behavior and yet still die because you take that behavior. To do the right thing is not always the safe thing to do. I'm not talking about what's safe in this presentation. I'm talking about what's our right to do, naturally and inherently in creation. Is it a right or is it not a right? That's all I care about. I'm not talking about whether negative consequences will be rained down upon me by brainwashed cult members if I perform the behavior that I have the right to perform. I'm just trying to conceptually have you understand that the right to do a specific behavior to end duress exists in nature. 
So let's look at what duress is. Duress is a condition, a continuous condition of coercion, of the free will of a being or group of beings by another being or group of beings through threats of violence and or actual acts of violence if those being coerced do not comply with the decrees or commands they are given. That's what duress is. It's someone saying to you, you will comply to my decrees or commands, or I threaten you with violence if you don't comply. That's the condition of duress. When people are held in the condition of duress, they are unlawfully, and I mean unlawfully not by man's law, but by natural law, prevented from exercising their free will to engage in rights which they actually possess, and or they are coerced through threats of violence to perform behaviors against their free will. Meaning if they don't do something, violence will be conducted upon them. Or if they do something that the masters tell them they, they must not do, violence will be conducted upon them, even if that behavior is one of their rights. That is what duress is. That's what duress always has been. That's what duress always will be. And every single individual in this room, listening on video, and in the entire world, is living in the condition of duress, whether they know it or not. I am under duress, you are all under duress. Every person here is living in a, a state of continuous duress. And there is no one on this planet that has the right to hold anyone in the condition of duress. And every person held under the condition of duress has the right to end that condition immediately upon its beginning. By whatever means necessary to end it. That is our natural law right, our birthright. So why do people make the distinction between people who put other people in duress as common thug criminals or mafia types robbing people directly on the street or demanding, demanding protection money to allow them to keep operating a business? They separate those people from the people who are saying, you can't exercise this right without my, m without my approval. Or if we find you doing this particular behavior that we told you you can't do, we're going to come and shoot you or strangle you or do other kinds of violence unto you. Yet our society somehow is so brainwashed we make this distinction. You know, we think that one group of people is not holding someone in duress, namely the police and the military and the government officials, and yet the common street thug or the common mafia enforcer is holding people in duress without right. Well, news flash, everyone, there's no difference between the states of duress in these images. Because if you believe certain people have rights that other people believe, you don't understand truth, you don't understand morality, and you don't understand natural law. Every one of these uh, instances in this slide is a criminal act that the person has no right to perform as an individual. So what's the difference between a police officer and a strong arm mafia enforcer? Nothing. There is no difference between them. They are both common criminals. They are both members of gangs, and I would have been that word to say they are both members of cults who do not question orders or think for themselves. They both initiate violence to enforce policy. Both have a code of secrecy, a lack of transparency, and both cite the institution's policies for the violence that they, mani that they manifest in reality. They are ultimately responsible for their behaviors, yet they want to somehow abdicate themselves of that responsibility by saying, oh, the politicians ordered me to do it. The lawmakers ordered me to do it. It doesn't matter who tells you to do something that's wrong. If you did it, you're responsible for the harm. So, you know, we, we look at mafia crime, right? And this is big in my, where I come from. You know, South Philly's a mafia stronghold. Uh, almost everybody I know knows somebody that's been involved at some point or another in mob syndicates, you know? 
So let me ask you a question. You're, they're all identified with the gang, the mafia, the mob. Does that mean that the person who's the, the bag man running drugs or running number tickets or, you know, taking bets or something like that, uh, isn't identifying with the same gang as the person who actually conducts a hit? You could argue, well, one's exercising one level of violence that's, that's very high, and yet the other is simply on the team that's condoning that violence. They may not be performing an act like the ones at the bottom, but nonetheless, they're condoning it because they're on the same team and they're still helping the people who are doing that. You know what that's called? It's called a complicit gang member. Or, I would word it, a complicit cult member. They're just as complicit. The lower level people involved who are supporting the institution that runs their behavior are just as complicit as the murderers in that institution. It's the same thing with any institution. You could look at normal common street gangs. I mean, this is big on the West Coast with a lot of gangs. It's big in Chicago with gangs. New York uh, to a, a, an extent as well. Philadelphia gangs are a little bit to a lesser extent, but, but major US cities have problems with gangs. Okay, now we will look at their actions and say, well, hey, what about the, what about the lower ranking gang member who is just out, you know, selling a, a couple of uh, bags of cocaine on the corner. Well, they're still identified and are a lower level member of a gang that's conducting violence. They're conducting this violence for territory. They're conducting this violence for the right to uh, operate within the region that they're operating in. Hence why it's called a gang. They control territory that they operate in and try to keep anybody out from that territory. It doesn't matter what level of involvement they have. They're involved with a gang that is violent, and therefore they are complicit in the violence that is backed by this gang. Well, that's one thing. Yeah, exactly. The, the people who are actually doing organized crime, no one thinks they have a right to do this organized crime. Correct. You know, no one would think, hey, the gang members have this right, the mafia has this right. You wouldn't think that, yet people believe government has these rights to conduct violence upon people. So again, you look at some of these behaviors that are conducted by the cult of ultimate evil, namely the uh, segment of that cult called the police. Look at, look at the kind of violence they conduct, throwing a paralyzed man out of a wheelchair because he didn't stand up upon command. You know, ripping a school child out of a desk violently, almost breaking their neck by turning them their chair over backwards. Pepper spraying student protesters in the face with two million Scoville pepper spray. Kicking a, a handcuffed woman in the back of the head with a round kick. That's a big man right there, boy. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly what that is, a fucking coward. That's exactly what that is. Let me tell you something, folks. These are the tame examples of police brutality in this country. Tame examples. Now, you look at the desk guy with the happy smile on his face. You know, oh, and notice the stormtrooper in front of him. You know, he thinks that's one of the people he should be, uh, you know, modeling his behavior upon. Yeah. But what is that? What is that paper pusher in the cult of ultimate evil? He is a complicit gang member. That's what he is. Just like the bag man in the mob, just like the lower level gang member selling some cocaine on the corner. Doesn't matter what your level of complicity in the violence is. You're complicit in the violence. These people are destroyed at a soul level. They're husks. They are spiritually dead husks. You know, people will say, oh, Mark, you're dehumanizing people. No, I'm trying to tell you how spiritually destroyed a human being can become. And you know what? We have to understand, not all of them are going to be able to be reached with words. Not all of them. We may be able to reach many.
That's what our job is to do. I'm, not, I'm saying we have to step up the effort more to reach people with reason and words and morality, an understanding of morality. But there are some who are destroyed beyond the ability to reverse their course. They're dedicated to evil, whether they even understand that their behavior is evil or not, because that's what a cult does. It makes their membership completely identified with their position in the cult. And then they just say, I'm in this far, I'm all the way in. And no one's going to convince me that I was wrong. See, this is thankfully, thank all of creation that I was able to extricate myself from when I was involved in the cult that I was involved in, namely the dark occult, Satanism. Finally, I was able to be reached with language and reason and persuasion. I also had to practically ruin my life and almost die. That's how hard-headed I was. And then I think I was that hard-headed. There are people who make me look like a light case of the ego. A light case. You know? So I'm trying to explain to people, you have to understand what we're really up against spiritually. How deadened certain people are spiritually. It's going to take Herculean monumental efforts to try to mentally and spiritually reform these people. That's what the great work is. I'm not saying this to make you depressed about it. We have to know what the task is. We have to know it definitively, honestly, and accurately. Or we're not going to get this job done. Again, these are the modern so-called house slaves. Now, what the house slaves of the American Civil War era period were, tragically what they were, as violent and immoral and completely and utterly wrong as the practice of slavery was being performed in this country, you have to understand there were people who were taken from their native lands. And because they were given a little bit more privilege, they beat and whipped and kept the other slaves in line that were often family members, parts of their tribal groups, etc. You'll look in these images, there are slaves with weapons in their hands, threatening the other slaves who are non-compliant with the master's demands. They're willing to do this to their own people for a little bit extra food or a warmer blanket or, or instead of to sleep uh, you know, in the elements in a field, in a crop field, to sleep in a doghouse in a crop field. Literally, literally. You see some of them with guns, holding guns while the others are in chains. I mean, this is a special kind of psychopath. This is a special kind of immoral human being. Instead of trying to do something to end the condition for all of them, they took up the side of the master. And this is what the modern police forces are. And the modern militaries are. And in every country in the world. It doesn't matter, not just this country, everywhere on earth. That's what this cult of ultimate evil actually is. They are slaves themselves conducting slavery upon other slaves. And they don't even want to be free. There's a special place in hell for the house slave. There's a special place in hell. Whether you believe in hell or not, I'm talking about there is a special place of spiritual t torment that is reserved in the hearts and minds of people who do jobs like that. The order follower always bears more moral culpability than the order giver. Because their excuse is, I'm just following my orders, like the Nazis said at Nuremberg. Their excuse is, well, that's the law, and I don't make it, I just enforce it. I'm just doing my job. They bear more moral responsibility than the person telling them to, to take the action. Because the order follower is the one who performs the behavior. And in taking that action, they actually bring the resultant harm into physical manifestation in the world. 
Order following is the pathway to every form of evil and chaos in our world. It should never be seen as a virtue by anyone who considers themselves a moral human being. Order followers have ultimately been personally responsible and morally culpable for every form of slavery and every single totalitarian regime that has ever existed upon the face of this planet. And get as offended about that as you like, those listening out in the internet world, but nothing will make that statement untrue. Nothing will make this one untrue either. If you did it, you are ultimately responsible, not whoever told you to do it. The excuse that I was ordered to do this immoral behavior by someone else is no excuse at all and should never be accepted as an excuse by anyone with a conscience. Now, I'm going to get into a section that some even here today may find difficult, okay? Now, I'm going to refute the notion that is popularly held that people have the right to quote unquote believe whatever they want to believe. And I'm here to tell everybody here and everybody listening, wherever they're listening from, we do not have the right to believe everything we want to believe. There are beliefs that are not rights. Okay? There are beliefs that are not rights. Now let me qualify this first by explaining the difference between a thought and a belief. Everyone can think anything they want, which means for a time you are holding something in your mind to consider it. This is a thought. I'm not suggesting thought police, okay? What I'm saying is, since we have the capacity to reason through our thoughts, when you come to a completely erroneous, immoral, and incorrect conclusion by using your thoughts, and then you harden and compress and harden those thoughts into a belief structure, that is when they cross the line between thought and belief system. I'm trying to explain to people that not every belief system is a right. Thoughts are rights that we all possess, but we do not have the right to, in perpetuity, continuously believe certain things which are wrong and immoral. Contrary to popular disinformation and widely held but erroneous belief, as human beings, we do not possess the right to believe whatever we want to believe. We possess the right to believe whatever we want to believe, even if those beliefs are wildly out of touch with reality, only if those beliefs do not condone violence against or support the slavery of other beings. That's the kinds of beliefs we have. So I'll give an example. Do you have the right to believe that there are pink and purple striped unicorns, wa unicorns wandering through the air at any given moment? Yeah, you have the right to believe that. You want to know why? That's not violent toward other people. That's why you can believe that nonsense. Okay? That's why I don't have a problem with most religious beliefs. I may think that they are nonsense myself, but as long as they are not condoning or supporting the commission of violence and slavery against other people, believe whatever the hell you want. Where I have a moral problem with it, rightly so, is when someone else believes I'm somebody's rightful slave or anyone else is anyone's rightful slave. Now I have a big moral problem with that. That's not a right. No one has that right to even believe that in perpetuity, in a continued state of thought. We can consider the notion of slavery by thinking about it, but if we don't come to the correct moral conclusion that it is immoral, wrong, and should never be practiced and should be immediately ended, the belief that it's okay to perpetrate it is wrong. It's a wrongdoing. Because you are actually condoning the actions that continue this immoral behavior. <laughs> Would people in the southern colonies have had the right to continue to believe that the practice of owning black slaves in the South was a right. That wasn't one of their rights. 
even if they didn't own slaves themselves. How many people owned slaves in the Civil War era period? And when slaves escaped from the forced labor camps called plantations they were forced to work on, when they escaped, the person would have tried to capture them and bring them back into, into captivity because they believed that this was a legitimate condition of owning other people. They had no right not only to do those behaviors, but to even believe in the legitimacy of the condition of slavery. No such right exists and never has. Sorry, let me go back a slide. To believe government is legitimate is to believe that slavery is legitimate, and that is not a right. We can consider the notion of government through our thoughts, but when we erroneously come to the incorrect conclusion and harden that into a belief system, that becomes a violent belief. The people who believe that slavery is legitimate through government are not within their rights. They are not within their rights to continue to believe that slavery is legitimate for anyone. Unfortunately, in the modern world, you know, people don't understand the distinction. They, they think there's some sort of a distinction. They don't understand that they're the same thing, government and slavery. Government is slavery. If, if stealing 100% of the product of someone else's labor is slavery, at what percentage does it become not slavery? This question was originally, I ask this question all the time, but this question was actually originally posed by Frederick Douglass, a, a, a slave who escaped his ca captivity in the south, south and eventually went to Europe because he was under such duress of being captured and brought back into slavery in the southern states it, when he moved to the northern states that he had to actually go over the ocean to where at least black slavery wasn't practiced at the time. Although they're in the, the other kind of slavery called the belief in a king and queen, called royalty, you know? Slavery works better in the modern world because now people don't even know that they're slaves through mind control and mental conditioning and calling it a euphemized term called government and authority. Here's the bottom line when it comes to belief systems, folks. As difficult even as it may be for some people in this room even to get this concept, no one has the right to believe that people are property. In addition to that, no one has the right to believe that slavery is legitimate for anyone. And now, I'm going to take it a step further. Really pay attention to this one. Because here's where people are really in wrong belief who are refusing to get this message and wake up. No one has the right to believe that slavery is legitimate for anyone, including themselves. This is a big thing you hear even in the freedom movement. Well, if other people want to be slaves, that's their right. No, it's not. No, it's not. No one has the right to believe that they are rightful slaves. Do you want to know why? That belief perpetuates the belief in the legitimacy of slavery, which is also not a right. You don't have a right to believe that you're the legitimate slave of another being. There is no such right in nature. Never has been. We have to abandon the, this erroneous notion that somehow government is legitimate and a ruling class and a slave class is legitimate through the, the idea of authority, this erroneous notion. And I think Samuel Adams, again, who is my heart and soul of a dissident, Samuel Adams, who rode on horseback from Boston to Philadelphia to speak at the Pennsylvania State House and urge for a physical rebellion against the tyranny of the crown. Without that man doing that, the American Revolution may have never happened. And I'll tell you something, it's probably, it's probably the closest thing to a divinely inspired holy act that has ever taken place on this planet. 
And the people who don't understand what happened in the American Revolution, I feel sorry for them for believing in revisionist history, which I'm going to talk about. Because we need to understand what exactly happened here in the Revolutionary War era period and understand the type of blood sacrifice that, thank God, the men who were willing to give that blood conducted. Because they made it possible for someone like me to stand here and speak these words today. We would be bending over and kissing the ass of a king or queen. And most of us still are, except it's called government now. Let me tell you something, without those men, these ideas wouldn't have propagated in this land to the extent that they did. We owe them a debt. I, I know the significance of their actions, of their minds and of their actions, because I've read their philosophy, which most people have never done. Samuel Adams, the chief conspirator of the American Revolution, said, It is the greatest absurdity to suppose it in the power of one or any number of men to renounce their essential natural rights or the means of preserving those rights, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. If men, through fear, fraud, or mistake, should in terms renounce or give up an essential natural right, the eternal law of reason and the grand end of society would absolutely vacate such renunciation. He is saying here, you don't have a right to give up your rights because that puts everybody else in jeopardy of slavery. You have no right not to understand what a right is. You have a right to not understand how to bake an apple pie, but you don't have a right to un not understand what a right is. This is something that is a duty to understand. It transcends a right. You must understand it because the ignorance of its understanding places other beings in jeopardy of slavery. And he's saying if somebody says I'm the rightful slave of another, the society itself simply vacates that, that abdication of a right and says no, you do not have a right to abdicate that. It's not only a right, it's a duty and a responsibility that you can never shirk actually in nature. You can only make the claim that you're gonna shirk it, but you can't really do that. Continuing with this quote, he said, the right of freedom being the gift of God Almighty, it is not in the power of man to alienate this gift and voluntarily become a slave. That's why they don't want people reading the Founding Fathers writings. They might get some crazy ideas that they're free and not owned by others, and don't have a right to renounce their freedom. That wild idea might break out, and freedom along with it. Yeah, they don't want, they don't want you reading these man's writings. Certainly not. That's why they're going to pull them from school, and that's why they're going to propagate these Marxists, these neo-Marxists, and these absolutely outright communist ideas that somehow these were evil men. And the people who buy into this PSYOP don't know their history at all. At all. Contrary to popular disinformation and widely held but erroneous belief, as human beings, we do not possess the right to be apathetic about whatever we want. This notion that I don't care whether we are enslaved is also not a right. You have a right not to care what whatever popular celebrity of the day, what fashion they happen to be wearing. Because I certainly don't care about those things. And that's my right not to care about them. I personally don't, have, don't care about what's happening in popular sports or popular music. Couldn't give a damn, couldn't care less. I don't have the right not to care about the dynamics that govern human freedom. I don't have that right. Why? Because refusing to understand it is putting other beings in jeopardy of slavery. There is no such right not to understand our rights or say, we don't care, I don't care what, what a right is. I don't care whether society is enslaved. My own grandmother on my father's side of the family looked at me in the face one day and said, I know that we're all enslaved and I don't care. I'm like, you have to be kidding me. I said, how many children do you have? Two. How many grandchildren do you have? Two. How many great-grandchildren do you have? One. 
said, you have two children, two grandchildren, and a great-grandchild, and you don't care whether the world is enslaved? And you think that's your right not to care? I mean, you have to be kidding me that the people, people like this exist within our own families. No one has the right to not care that slavery is continuing and that freedom is being destroyed. This is not a right that exists in nature. Again, you have a right not to care about any frivolous thing that you don't want to care about, but you don't have a right not to care about rights and freedom. It's a duty and a responsibility that you can never shirk in nature. There's also complicity in evil and slavery through silence. Contrary to popular disinformation and widely held but erroneous belief, as human beings, we do not possess the right to remain silent about whatever we want. This is complicity by saying, even if absolute immoral violent behavior is conducted and I know it's wrong, I'm going to sit back and do nothing, not even speak about its wrongness. And that's not a right. If I sit back and watch a perpetual condition of duress and slavery take place in my midst, and I don't speak out against it, I am by my non-action uh, partaking in a complicit act with evil. I am condoning by my silence and apathy the evil that's being conducted. And that's not a right. So it's, this is hard for some people to hear because a lot of people say, well, a, a wrong can only be an action conducted. No, it's not that simple. You can perform wrong in your thoughts and in your emotions and in your non-actions. Wrongdoings can be performed. So even this crowd needs to explore this dynamic more and understand this dynamic more. And I understand this is going to be controversial even in our circles. We possess the right to be silent about whatever we want only if that silence does not diminish the rights and freedoms of others. In other words, it is not a right to remain silent about the ongoing condition of human slavery. Not a right. By passively accepting evil and remaining silent, we are participating in the evil. Those who through their silence allow evil to be done unchallenged are just as immoral as those who are doing it. And the meme here that I found on the internet says, when freedom is at stake, your silence is not golden, it's yellow. See, that's where we find most of our friends and family members. Some of my friends and family members will say, oh yeah, I recognize this is going on, but I want no part in exposing it. I want no part in talking about it. You know, that's called being a coward. And being a coward is a bad person. Because we are already at war. And I'm not just talking about a spiritual or mental war. We are already at physical war. Physical war is being conducted upon the people of this country and the world. Now here's the actual result, folks. Here's the actual numbers. Think about this number in a war. If the media would be all over it. Over 10,000 Americans alone have now been summarily executed without trial on the streets of America since the massive 9-11 false flag ritual by the standing army invasion force known as the American police. And I put the word American in double quotes because they are nothing of the kind. They are trash un-American, order-following vermin. And I'll say it to their face. 10,000 lives gone with no trial. That's called public executions. Yet we don't call it that. We euphemize it. And people who are complicit with this behavior condone it. That's who lives among us. Dirty, rotten Tories. 
who would have supported the British Crown and their henchmen during the American Revolutionary Era period. They're no different than those Tories. This is the standing army invasion force that the Founding Fathers warned us about. A standing army was repeatedly, repeatedly told to the public by the Founding Fathers and American revolutionaries that if you let a standing army rise up in your midst, all around you, you will have tyranny. And that's exactly what we allowed to happen. And this is, that, this is who they are. This is a foreign invasion standing army force. That's the standing army the Founding Fathers warned us about in all of their writings. And they said, that's the force that you're going to have to prevent from rising up in this country, and you're going to have to do it by maintaining a well-regulated militia, which I've talked about ad infinitum on my podcast series and in my Second Amendment presentation, which everybody should fully understand, especially in these times when it's coming under attack again because of these nonsense false flag ritual killing events. Samuel Adams, once again, I'm going to have a lot of quotes from the Founding Fathers in this presentation. He said, if you love wealth, he said this in Philadelphia, if you love wealth greater than liberty, the tranquility of servitude greater than the animating contest for freedom, go home from us in peace. We seek not your counsel nor your arms. Crouch down and lick the hand that feeds you. May your chains set lightly upon you and may posterity forget that you are our countrymen. You know, I say this before every one of my band shows. That's the intro to our, our performance. I restate Samuel Adams' words before we start to play. Let's go into the next section, dissidents. This word means to be an opponent of the established political order of the time, so-called order. I'd say to be an opponent of the established chaos of the day. So what's a dissident? Well, what's a true dissident? A true dissident is somebody who opposes the established political condition of slavery, regardless of how dangerous it is for their physical safety, because they understand that slavery is always immoral and illegitimate, and they correctly value creation's gift of free will above all else. I say to people a lot, a true relationship between individuals is always a three-dimensional relationship, meaning that there has to be a connection between all individuals involved in the relationship and truth itself. Anything else is a disconnected, flat, two-dimensional, so-called relationship. That's why a true relationship that we have, the other person is always connected with the values of truth and the, value, the principles of natural law, if it's a true relationship. I mean, you know, the American revolutionaries are no better, there's no better example anywhere of a true dissident that valued their people and their country that they were living upon and stood against tyranny. And then you have someone like an individual, you know, like the person who stood in front of the tank in Tiananmen Square before the Tiananmen Square massacre. I mean, that, you want to talk about balls. Yeah. I mean, you want to talk about courage. There's somebody to look up to. You'll have this argument all the time, well, what are we gonna do, stand up to tanks? Yeah, we're gonna stand up to tanks if that's what it takes, yeah. I'll stand up to a tank if that's what it takes to protect freedom and truth, yeah, absolutely. Think I'm worried about what these psychopaths have? I'll force your hand to drop hydrogen bombs on the world. I'm not backing down, I don't care how many people you kill or threaten. You want to know why? I know who we're really up against. I know definitively, not by a belief, not by reading about it in a book, not by being told by anybody else. I was in the room with these psychopaths who run the world. And if you were there too, you'd fight as hard as me or harder. There would be no excuses about, I have this, 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 or that to do. This is what you'd be doing, everybody. 
That's why people ask me, what do you want to be able to do, Mark? Do you want any special power? Would you like to have any kind of a special ability or power? Yeah, I say the same thing all the time to every room I speak in front of. I want to have the ability to, against natural law, kidnap an individual and bring them someplace that I want to bring them without their consent. Now, how strange does that sound for me to say? But that's what I want the ability to do. Un and, and without consequence. I would like to have the supernatural ability to kidnap another human being against their will without consequence because you know where I would take them? I would take them to a satanic ritual house dungeon and I'd dump them in the basement and they, the satanists would have their way with them and the police would be guarding the ritual chamber and then no, no action would ever be taken against the satanists performing the rape or murder or violence that was, would be conducted and then they would know definitively what the world world is. Definitively, they would know. They wouldn't have a belief about it. They would know. That's why I want that power. You know? I would also take the ability to convey everything that I know with a touch. That would be a nice second, second power. That would be a, that would be a nice one. Okay. Yeah. Let's look at some historical examples of dissidents throughout time in chronological order. We're going to look at Jesus. Now, let me make a caveat here. I say this all the time whenever I bring up Jesus as any kind of example in any of my work, okay? One, I'm not propagating any religion, I'm not propagating Christianity, okay? I'm not uh, in any way putting this up on a pedestal. I'm talking about this in an allegorical sense, or if you want to prefer to look at Jesus as a historical figure, whether he was or not, we're talking about the story as portrayed in the New Testament and the actions and the teachings, the actions he performed and the teachings that he propagated as either a historical or allegorical figure. So take that for what it is worth. I am not suggesting that anybody think about it in any particular way. I'm telling you that the, the example is a valid one, and the teachings are valid ones, even if you don't want to look at this as a historical religious figure, okay? I'm going to simply refer to what the story in the New Testament tells us, what it portrays, what it tries to teach us, okay? So we're going to look at Jesus, we're going to look at, of course, the Founding Fathers and the revolutionaries who fought the American Revolutionary War. We're going to look at the black slaves of early America and the Civil War era period. And we're going to look at the anarchists of today. Again, I'm not going to particularly, you know, focus on the image or visage of any particular anarchist, but just talk about the movement of anarchists. And this is a nice, uh, you know, I, I use this uh, uh, a with the circle around it like other anarchists do, but I put no masters, no slaves. You know, some of them put no gods, no masters. You know, but I prefer to look at it as what real anarchy means. No masters and no slaves. There's no ruling class and there's no slave class. This is a great meme I found online. It says, I am me. I am free. I declare my independence as a sovereign human being. I do not consent to be governed. I commit no crime as I harm no other. I do not subscribe to labels or dogmatic ideologies. I treat everybody as a brother or sister. That's what an anarchist is. That's what a real anarchist is. So, the first example of the four uh, examples we're going to talk about, Jesus being a dissident. In the allegorical story in the New Testament of Jesus, he was a dissident who opposed the three major institutions of slavery of his day. And incidentally, these three institutions are the three main institutions which still perpetuate human slavery today. Nothing has changed since those, the, the day uh, that the story of Jesus was, the time period it was written about. Zero. Nothing has changed. The same institutions are in control of this planet as were in control of this planet then over 2,000 years ago. And here's what they are. I call them the unholy trinity. Religion, which is really the, the father figure of it all. 
See, people always ask me what's at the, the top in the worldly sense. Oh, is the, are banks in control, Mark? Are the governments in control? Is the shadow government or, or deep state in control? No. It's a priest class. Those who are familiar with my work will understand this. The force of religion ultimately runs this world still to this day. They've just taken a overtly a closed down role, a hidden role. They've gone from the overt to the covert. Okay, so they've gone into the underground occulted realm, but they are still ruling from that occulted realm. The occult rulers of the world constitute a religious priest class, as I've talked about in much of my other work. But this is the father of the unholy trinity, because it is thought control. That's what religion is there to do, false religion. It perpetuates ignorance through blind belief. It's based upon belief, not search for truth, for the actual truth of the reality of the laws of nature. It is controlled by a dark occult priest class, and religion is the essence of all forms of mind control. The two things I'm going to be talking about underneath are also forms of mind control and religion. That's why religion is the ultimate force holding back an understanding of natural law and true freedom from humanity. Because money, as I'm going to talk about in a moment, is also a religion. It's the second most powerful religion that there is, besides actual religion itself. The idea of a hardened false belief system in the mind instead of a search for and an understanding of truth. So religion is the basis of the old world order of slavery, so-called order. It works with these other two institutions as part of the unholy trinity system. Money is the feminine or mother figure of the trinity because it's about emotional control. Just as religion is about the control of our thoughts, the control of what we care about is directed by the money aspect or the financial aspect of the unholy trinity system of control. How many people continuously emotionally focus upon money almost all day, every day? This is what they have, this is what the main motivational force for behavior is in the world. This is what I just talked about in Acapulco at the Anarchapoco conference. Because you have a lot of monetary religionists there. I'm trying to explain to, to these people who are super gung-ho into the financial sector of things and how they want to, you know, put, end the Fed and bring in cryptocurrency prosperity. Re money is still a form of a religion. You know, this is something that if it controls your emotions and this is what you focus on instead of performing behaviors for the, the reason that they are simply the right thing to do, you're falling short of an accurate understanding of truth and morality. And that constitutes religious binding. The, the monetary system perpetuates apathy for truth. Oh, if there's no money to be made in it, why do it? It's the new God to which human beings now entirely devote their care, attention, and energy. I call money the ultimate religion, the ultimate form of a religion. It's the basis for the new world order, the dark new world order, the, the, the so-called order, but it's chaos and death. And these two institutions, religion and money, always work together to actually create the death. This is what the allegorical story of Jesus in the New Testament was about, the unholy trinity of religion, money, and government. Jesus went against the religious priest class first, the Pharisees and Sadducees, as I'm going to be explaining, then the temple cha uh, money changers, which was the, the, inner, the, the uh, fiat currency bankers of his day, and then finally the Roman government had him crucified at the behest of father and mother. So government is the bodily part of the control system because it works through physical means, through their order followers. It perpetuates cowardice because people don't want to speak up and do anything because of the fear of you know, harm that will be conducted upon them by the government agents. It's based upon the erroneous belief in authority. It's the violent enforcer for father and mother, the dark occultists and the banksters. And it is itself the new world order of chaos and death, the dark new world order. So let's look at G how Jesus was a dissonant against these three institutional bodies. 
Jesus was an opponent of the established religious priest class during his lifetime. He taught spirituality, which was in direct opposition to the worldview of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the most powerful Judaic religious sects of his time. And he didn't do it so politely, folks. You read the stories. He was very vehement against these people and their uh, very sketchy mor morality. You know, and they were so concerned with, you know, dogmatic law in the Judaic religion and religious texts, but they weren't really focused on truly treating be people as other free sovereign beings. You know, more, true morality wasn't their real objective. Control was. And that's why he went against them. You know, and if you really read the stories, he wasn't so soft-spoken about it. You know, he told them just like it was. He, told, he, he, he was, wasn't afraid to speak his mind and say how it was. Again, you don't have to accept the historicity of the account given in, the, in the, the scriptural text, but the idea is to understand the allegorical principles therein contained so that we can learn a lesson from them. Jesus spoke out against the monetary powers of his day. He even took physical action against them in the famous biblical story where he drove the money changers from the temple in Jerusalem. And the money changers were the equivalent of the monopolistic banking institutions of his time. You can compare them almost to the Federal Reserve System, if you will, or the other central banks. You know, he wasn't afraid to take out a switch and whip people in the ass if he had to. Because what they were doing was completely immoral, and it was fraudulent, and it was harming other people of their hard-earned resources, etc. And, and it was defrauding them mentally and spiritually as well, placing value upon money when it was supposed to be about morality. Jesus spoke out against the so-called authority of the Roman government, which was the most powerful governmental institution on earth in his time. Government was the institution which eventually convicted Jesus as a, quote, enemy of the state and ordered that he be murdered by crucifixion. So, you know, he often said, render the, to Caesar that which is Caesar's, which is, you know, people think that's so soft. He's talking about, let them have their crap. That's crap. And don't have anything to do with their crap. That's what he was saying the equivalent of in that type of language. You know, people think that's it's a soft way of saying it, but in his time it would have been like, to hell with the government. Let idiots believe in that shit. You know, understand what is really, quote unquote, of God. Meaning natural law, meaning true, objective, inherent, cosmic, universal morality. Which is what he was attempting to teach people. Unfortunately, you know, even with... The, uh, the power of the allegorical teachings, whether you believe he was an actual you know, rabbi of that time period and, and geographic location, or whether you think it was just a story written by human beings to try to attempt to convey morality to others, it didn't really work out so well, did it? Because we haven't been liberated from slavery yet. We're still in the same human condition that the people of that time were in then. Nothing has changed, which is why we have to step up the effort of the great work. Through the allegorical story in the New Testament, we see how all the institutions of slavery of Jesus' time, the same institutions of slavery that exist today, colluded to have him murdered with the consent of the brainwashed population. The government, the religious institutions. Here you have the religious and governmental institutions together, depicted in, in a... In a uh, you know, cinematic portrayal of the events as depicted in the New Testament. And then Jesus was finally, actually, the murder was actually performed by the police of his time, the Roman centurions. I say to uh, traditional Christians all the time, you do realize the police murdered Jesus Christ, do you not? And they look at me like I have like snakes growing out of my neck, you know? <laughs> And, and big, huge, you know, antelope horns coming out the top of my head. And I'm like, how could you read the same text that I just read and not understand that the murder of Christ was conducted by a collusion of religion, money, and governmental powers? And the actual assassination slash murder slash execution was conducted by the police that followed their orders to do it. 
could people who claim to be uh, uh, adherence to the Christian religion not understand that allegory? It's an, an unfathomable to me that they cannot recognize the Roman centurions were the police and military of the Roman Empire during that time period. And if they were given the orders to do this and did it because they were following orders, people think that wouldn't happen today. If Jesus existed today and the police were, were commanded to murder him on command, they would do it in a heartbeat without one questioning, without questioning the motives of their masters one iota. And yet, people who call themselves Christians can't see it. They're a joke. They're fake-ass Christians, and they're a joke. And I'll say it to all the so-called Christians listening out there in Internet land, you're a joke. You're fake-ass Christians. You're not real, true Christians at all. You've been clowned and had, and you think that the, the authority of the universe shares power with little old man, with little old humanity. And that's a joke, because they bought Romans 13. Yeah, the book that they buy the, the justification for authority being invested in man is called Romans. And they can't even see that, con that contradiction. It's right in the word of what the book is called. Who do you think wrote the book? Why is it called Romans? The people who murdered Jesus are telling you that their authority is legitimate. And joke-ass Christians can't comprehend that. You're clowned out, boys and girls who call yourselves real Christians. You're clowned out. You're asshats. <laughs> Through the allegorical story in the New Testament, we see how all the institutions of slavery of Jesus' time, okay, I've read this already. The, the Roman centurions actually performed the physical crucifixion in the biblical account. They performed the harmful behavior upon being ordered to do so and, and caused the actual death of the, the being that was actually teaching true morality. And yet, people would have said in that day, they're just doing their jobs. They're just following their orders. The bottom line is the unholy trinity of priests, bankers, politicians, and police, so in other words, religion, money, and government, murdered Jesus Christ. That's the unholy trinity that murdered the teacher of the values of the Christian tradition and the people who actually say that they're followers of the values of that tradition don't even understand that simple concept that's laid out beautifully in their own allegorical stories and their own scriptures. Yet someone who doesn't claim to be of quote unquote religious faith does understand what's actually being taught in those scriptures and is trying to communicate it to people who say they're devout Christians. Let's look at the second group of dissidents who I call real revolutionaries. We need a lot more real revolutionaries that are willing to put it all on the line today. The founding fathers and revolutionary colonists were true dissidents because they rejected the rulership of the British monarchy and physically fought the henchmen of British royalty for their freedom. They were brutally oppressed by psychopathic, mind-controlled order followers who traveled across an ocean at the decree of a psychopathic so-called king to take away their rights. I mean, imagine this. You want to talk about house slaves. Imagine these dirty redcoats who came across an entire ocean to oppress people that were just trying to live their lives free at the behest of some psychopathic, utter piece of trash who is probably so genetically inbred that, I, I mean, I, like, like King George III was an inbred piece of psychopathic trash who was barely a boy. He was some rat punk boy, okay, who wasn't even a grown-up individual thinking he's God, I'm God, and I'm going to tell, the, I'm going to command these people to go over and oppress people that are saying I no longer want to uh, comply with the dictates of some boy God who says he's king and ruler. I mean, it's hard to tell who's worse. 
the psychopath giving the orders or the trash who followed his orders. They're both trash, just like they are today. Here's the piece of trash that calls himself king, and there's still people who call themselves kings and queens in the modern day. They're trash, trash, who need to be treated like trash. The American colonists lived under constant duress inflicted upon them by the British soldiers if they didn't obey, obey the king's edicts or hand over any of their hard-earned resources at the king's decree. They were oppressively taxed, prevented from using alternative currencies, and their, had their freedom of speech curtailed, their freedom of assembly curtailed as well, and had the, their right to self-defense through the ownership of firearms removed. That's what really started the American Revolution. Once they started taking the guns, it was on. Just like it will be this time. Right. Yeah. Know it like you know your name, boys and girls. Know it you like you know that sun's coming up on the eastern horizon, whether there's clouds out or not tomorrow morning. Know it like you know your name. When they start that, it's on. You know, the people who really value their freedom are not going quietly into the night because some little children want to take away their ability to defend their rights. I'll tell you that with 100% assuredness, with 1,000% assuredness in this country. You know, you're not going to get it done. You're not going to get that done without bloodshed. Forget what Jim Morrison said, up to your ankles. No, it's going to be up over your, the top of your head. And that's what I'm trying to avert with all my energy. I'm trying to help people avert that bloodshed because it's going to come if we don't wise up and un start understanding natural law and teaching it as widely as possible. So that, that image below was of the Boston Massacre where what was really the true opening volleys of the uh, opening volley of the American Revolution when British soldiers fired upon uh, Americans in Boston. The founding fathers and American revolutionaries physically repelled a standing army among them because they had no option but to fight and kill or die to secure their rights and the rights of their posterity. We have already entered into a situation that may require the same necessary use of defensive force. There is an ongoing deliberate conspiracy to paint the American founding fathers as those who did not have the best interests of the people of America at heart. I would highly urge those who have subscribed to this erroneous view to research the powerful influence of the evil globalist think tank institutions that crafted this nefarious and subversive PSYOP, which includes the Frankfurt School of Germany, and the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations of England and the Fabian Society of England. If you don't understand these institutions, you don't understand how mind control is propagated in the modern world. And you need to learn about them and you need to understand their influence, particularly in our educational institutions, our so-called educational institutions, which are Fabian, socialist run, owned and run. And they are taking marching orders from Tavistock. And they are taking marching orders from the former occultists that ran the Frankfurt School and propagated communist ideals and outright fascist ideals. You know, in, in my band, we have a, a song called Socio-Fascist Communazis Fuck Off. That's one of our songs, you know? Because people think that they're so different, the forms of totalitarianism. Socialism and Nazism and fascism and communism, they're so different, yeah. Because they don't all want to curtail human freedom and control all the resources of people and put them into abject slavery and tyranny. No, they're all different. The left wing and the right wing are so different from each other. Two wings of the same predatory bird of prey. That one offends everybody when we play it. <laughs>
One of the main purposes of the PSYOP to uh, conspiracy to portray the founding fathers of America as quote unquote the bad guys is to dissuade people from looking into the writings of the founding fathers, especially Thomas Paine and Samuel Adams, who wrote some of the highest consciousness philosophy ever written on this continent. I would also, in, in the Western Hemisphere, I would put Richard Wetherill up there as well. You know, as far as writing, I put Larkin Rose up there as well. You know, but these guys, I mean, you have to read their writings. You can't just hear the name and, and say, oh yeah, they were some of the founding fathers. You read their writings, you're gonna understand why they're taking this out of the schools. They're not playing games. They don't want people to understand what these men thought and wrote. Another part of this PSYOP is to discredit the philosophy and writings of Thomas Jefferson, the writer of the Declaration of Independence, because he was a slave owner. While this was true, the Founding Fathers were no angels, they were not perfect men, they certainly had flaws and made mistakes and did things that were wrong. I am not condoning everything that they did, and I am not saying that they were angelic by any stretch of anybody's imagination. They were flawed men. They did not have all the answers, and many of them did not go all the way in consciousness to true anarchy. And the understanding that all beings have the same rights to remain unharmed and unenslaved. So, while it was true Jefferson was a slave owner, he worked tirelessly to try to have the practice of slavery abolished in the colonies and in early America. And if you read his writings, he continuously puts forward as a theme how wrong and immoral slavery was. And let me tell you something, in the state of Virginia where he lived, it was illegal and punishable by death to release a slave in the state willfully because they actually did not consider them human beings and looked at it as you are going to unleash an animal upon our society. That is how fucked up their thinking was. You could have been jailed forever or put to death by the act of releasing us. Now, I say, whatever, it still should have been done. He still should have done it. I'm not making an excuse for why he didn't do it. He made a verbal contract upon traveling to the Second Continental Congress just before he left that upon his return he would free his slaves and he worked tirelessly to do that. He was involved in different anti-slavery abolitionist coalitions and he constantly uh, advocated for this in the state of Virginia. You know, it's, it's, it's a very interesting story about the Declaration of Independence. You have to really understand the, the clashes that happened during these committees. You know, the southern states were very, very, very vehement about keeping the slavery uh, practice in place. So Jefferson called the practice of slavery a moral depravity and a hideous blot upon society and continually worked toward abolition. He even wrote anti-slavery clauses into the de original Declaration of Independence, the original writing. But delegates of the southern colonies led by the South Carolina representative Edward Rutledge threatened to strike down the motion for American independence in committee in, at the Second Continental Congress if Jefferson did not willfully of his own accord remove the anti-slavery clauses from the original draft of the Declaration of Independence. Actually, Rutledge gathered up all the delegates of all the southern colonies and they walked out of Independence Hall in Philadelphia in mass. Benjamin Franklin and John Adams had vehement arguments with Thomas Jefferson who said, essentially, screw them. It's staying just as I wrote it. I'm not striking these clauses because slavery is immoral. Jefferson and Adams both said to him, we have to secure independence first. And this is, good. yes, it is a blot upon our society. They agreed, but they said, if these other rich men who wrongly are using these human beings as their, you know, 
their monetary system of, of labor for their, their crops that they grow and, and, and sell worldwide, and they walk out of this committee, America will never begin. We will never begin the country. It will die in this committee at the Continental Congress. They begged him to willfully remove the clauses and he finally capitulated and that's when the southern states came back in as a, a, a delegation and agreed to pass the motion for independence and sign the Declaration of Independence. But how many people know that history? Right, because we're not being taught that in schools. You know, the neo-Marxist uh, so-called educators want to create race division. They want it, they want to, they, most of all, they don't want you to understand the philosophies that the founders were really writing. So they want to paint them as only rich white men that did not care about what, the practices of slavery that were taking place, and that's simply untrue. Now, that being said, some of the southern delegates were bastards, and they held vehemently on to this immoral position. Edward Rutledge was probably the most vehement and immoral among them because he was the youngest and richest, and he had profited the most from this practice. You know, again, special places in hell reserved from people like that, and he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. But you want to talk about a piece of trash, that's the piece of trash that, that you know, helped to perpetuate this all the way to a point where, you know, a, a war had to be fought partially about it, although we know it wasn't entirely about that. You know, but um, yeah, but we have to understand the Northern Founding Fathers, they wanted to abolish the practice then and there, many of them. But it, it, they couldn't unite everybody under that banner. They had to get them under the banner of at least, let's create a place where we can maybe teach true freedom to people first. And not that effort obviously hasn't succeeded either. Again, the educational outreach has to be much bigger. That's what the great work really is. In this section, I just want to say something about, since we're talking about political revolutionary dissidents, what the difference between a true patriot and a false patriot is. Because a lot of people hate this word and think it's a dirty word, the word patriot, because they don't understand what the word really means. The definitions of patriot and traitor have been completely reversed in today's world. Modern so-called flag-waving quote-unquote patriots who uphold the belief in government are actually traitors to humanity whether they know it or not, because they advocate the very belief system that leads to the destruction of human freedom. And that's what a traitor does. The flag-waving patriots, so-called patriots, are traitors because what they back is the government. You know, and they're confusing the government with the people. And that, those things should never be confused. True dissidents are the real patriots because they love their country enough to stand against the tyranny at work within it. Do not make the mistake of confusing country, meaning the land and its people who live upon it, with the particular government that happens to be in control of the country. I love my country. think that that means I'm an ad advocate of politics and government. My country are the people and the land. I love my country. I serve my country in addition to serving truth. I serve truth above all else and I'll serve my country which means the people and the land and, and I will help advocate for their freedom and teach them the principles of freedom. But that doesn't mean I love government. I hate all forms of government because all forms of government are slavery. This is what a true patriot is. And what I consider it a high honor that when I receive a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Tesla Science Foundation, uh, grant, uh, you know, uh, bestowed on me by uh, the, the president of the foundation, N Nick Launchar, for doing the work that I've done with the Tesla Science Foundation. He gave me that award, and when he gave it to me at the New Yorker Hotel, the place where Nikola Tesla died, he said, I want to introduce Mark Passio, who I consider a true American patriot, and I almost broke down in tears. Yeah, that was a high honor to me from that man because he used the term in the true sense of what it really means. So that's what a real patriot is versus a false patriot. Thomas Paine said the duty of a true patriot is to protect his country from its government. 
Very true words. Modern military are not to be confused with revolutionary patriots and the militia of the people. They are the modern day equivalent of the king's henchmen. The supporters of the police and military are the modern day equivalent of the Tories, those who backed and supported the crown and the British troops during the American Revolutionary Era period. The military are obviously not fighting for our freedom, they are fighting for the empire of their masters and their order givers. The military and police are not the protectors of a free society, they are the enforcers of enslavement by the ruling class. And they need to wake up. Some of them are just on the verge of beginning a, a slight low level awakening process, but it has to be accelerated and advanced far beyond where the majority of them are. If they were really fighting for our freedom, this is what it would look like. <laughs> Let's talk about a really dark topic, overt slavery in early America. Not covert slavery like we're in now, but overt slavery. Some of the most abhorrent practices ever conducted upon human beings. Many of the black slaves of early America and Civil War period America were dissidents because they opposed their condition of overt slavery. Slaves of the Civil War period lived under continuous duress. They were viewed as someone else's property, forced to work under the threat of violence or death, and deprived of the very fruits of their own labor. That's the very definition of slavery. Black slaves in early America were kidnapped from their native lands and brought to America by ships over the Atlantic Ocean in crowded and unsanitary conditions, totally inhumane, unsanitary conditions. Those that even survived the journey across the Atlantic were sold at slave auctions and then taken to forced labor camps called plantations to endure indentured servitude, working crop fields in torturous conditions for the duration of their lives. Many who offered resistance were whipped or beaten mercilessly, hung, burned, or even fed to dogs alive. Laws were passed which barred slaves from escaping a state where slavery was legal to one where it had been banned. Runaway slaves were often hunted and returned to bondage. There were bounty hunters all over the northern states looking for escaped slaves from the southern states. And let me tell you something, folks. This is how the police forces of America started. Yeah, that's not revisionist history, ladies and gentlemen. That's real history. The police were started from runaway slave patrols in the northern colonies. Okay, in the northern states. Yeah, learn some true history. Study about how that really happened instead of some of the alternative so-called theories, conspiracy theories that are out there and wildly off from the truth. There's a true conspiracy. It's not no conspiracy. It's a historical fact. Laws were even passed to criminalize helping or harboring runaway slaves. You could be jailed or worse for even helping them escape. Some Civil, some Civil War era slaves, such as Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, acted as dissidents and offered resistance against the practice of slavery by helping, by escaping themselves and fleeing to states where slavery was not practiced and then helping other slaves escape as well. While means such as these certainly showed disdain for their former masters and their abhorrent actions, Many would argue that these means undoubtedly still con con constituted what could only be called passive resistance, since they did not directly take action against ho those who were conducting such hideous and immoral, immoral practices without any right to do so. Now, I'm not, not saying that 
they were wrong for doing this. They were uh, tremendous for doing this, okay? But it, in my estimation, I'm just speaking for myself, it doesn't go far enough. It's still advocating simply for escape to another place where this isn't going to be done to you. How many people still think, well, where can we run to? I'm going to expatriate. I'm going to go down to, uh, you know, uh, Uruguay, you know, or Costa Rica. I'm not running anywhere. I'm staying right here and fighting this evil. Not going anywhere. That's a patriot and a being with courage to fight evil. And if I'm struck down dead, I'll be struck down dead fighting for freedom, true freedom. That being said, I commend their efforts to at least help, you know, move slaves, former slaves into a safe area when they had fled their oppression and enslavers because so many laws and, and scenarios had been put in place to bring them back into indentured servitude. So they're to be commended at least for that. Who I commend much more and think of as true dissidents against this hideous practice were the slaves who actually physically rebelled against their masters. And let me tell you something, the media was at work as ever, painting it as something that, oh, this was a hideous, horrid massacre in Virginia. God forbid, beings that were being sold into indentured servitude and treated as other people's property were killing the people that did that thing, that horrible thing to them and put them in that condition. How dare they? How dare they kill their masters? You know? Imagine this, the, the media doing their job. You know, they're paid liars and paid deceivers. They're, they're still at work then as they are today. Some slaves during this time period rebelled physically. There were many slave revolts, most of which were violently suppressed. Such revol revolts were subsequently downplayed or entirely covered up in modern historical accounts. Every slave ever held under these deplorable conditions and immoral conditions possessed every right under natural law to rebel against, physically rebel against, fight against, and even kill their enslavers. Now, that being said, many of them died trying to kill them. See, once again, I'm never claiming or promising anybody that a physical fight against evil oppressors is going to end well or possibly even end with the person who's in the right still being alive. I'm just trying to explain to you the right exists and their behavior was morally right. Morally right. Get it burned into the brain. It was a morally correct and right behavior. They had every right to do this. Some of the more famous slave revolts were Gabriel Prosser's Rebellion in Richmond, Virginia in the year 1800. I'm going to skip the Haitian Revolution for a moment and come back to it. The German Coast Uprising in Louisiana in 1811, Nat Turner's Rebellion in Southampton County, Virginia in 1831, and John Brown's Raid on Harper's Ferry in Harper's Ferry, Virginia in 1859. The one that was not in the United States proper but in the Caribbean on the island of Haiti was called the Haitian Revolution and it was the most brutal of any slave rebellion and arguably the most successful of any slave rebellion. Because let me tell you something, folks, these guys and gals didn't play. They killed their masters often down to the last man, woman, and child with every right, every right to do it. And then they were 
brand, branded as somehow violent or barbarian or, oh, they're, they're, they're so, you know, violent or so, uh, you know, I don't know, a, a non-human or something. No, they were acting in the way that they have every human right to behave when they're enslaved and oppressed like that. Because no one was coming with reason to help them be liberated and no one was listening to the reason that the practice of holding them in duress like that was immoral and done without right. So they took up arms and did what they had to do and you know what? They are absolutely commended by me for doing it. Because that's what protecting your freedom is when you don't have any other recourse. And we're going to come to a place like that and it's going to make the Haitian Revolution look like a little boy and girl's tea party because of what exists, the kind of technology that exists in America. And I, once again, I'm trying to avert that. But without more teachers stepping up and doing this work, we're going to go right down that path of bloodshed. I'm just trying to help you guys understand what is required. This should not be my voice. I should not be the one do, doing this, saying this, you know? I should have 10 million choices to tag out to and have somebody else come in and pick up right where I leave off. If I so choose, or if any of the other people so choose, there should be 10 million teachers worldwide of this information, of natural law. Minimum. I think we can get it done with 10 million, but probably no less than that. And I mean 10 million who know it as well as I know it, who know it as well as former mystery tradition initiates knew it, who knew it like someone like Richard Wetherill knows it, who knows it like someone like Larkin Rose knows it, etc. Like Lennon Honor, like all the other individuals who spoke here today. We need more teachers of true objective morality. I'm looking at you and I'm talking to you. We need to step up our efforts. People have to shed the fear of speaking out and start doing this in a way that you can reach as many minds as possible. I don't care what method you use to do it. You might not like my methodology, you might not like my tact or tone, and I couldn't give a shit. All I care about is that you put the information out that needs to be put out there so we avert scenarios like this, because they're coming. And it's no joke and it's nothing to laugh about. And when people recognize what war is, if it comes to this land, I'm telling you, most people are not psychologically prepared and far fewer are physically prepared. I'm prepared in both aspects and I'll die today if required. Because I've done what I came here to do. You know, I'm fine. I'm fine with, you know, this having been my life up to this point. How many people can say that? Not many. I'm not saying that to, you know, put myself up on any kind of a pedestal. I'm just saying when you've re realized your purpose and you've done what you're here to do, there is no fear of death at all. I don't, I don't consider it for a moment. <clears throat> modern day anarchists, those who are saying no to slavery. Anarchists in modern times are dissidents, the true dissidents, because they fully reject the belief in authority and they reject having a ruling class or a centralized power structure to rule over them. Anarchists understand the truth that no being can legitimately rule another. By direct contrast, as we talked about earlier, every non-anarchist or statist is a supporter of slavery. And that's all I'm really going to say about the modern anarchist movement. That's what true anarchy is. You know, there's a lot of fake anarchists out there. I might do a presentation called Fake Ass Anarchists. <laughs> you know, all the hyphenized anarchists in the, in the so called anarchist movement, pranksters. Pranksters, if you know what that means in street lingo. Okay? They're a joke who have no idea what real anarchy is at all. At all because they don't understand natural law principles and ob objective morality. Nor do they understand that those come from the laws of creation, regardless of what you want to refer to that force as. They think we bestow rights on ourselves or on others. No, no, that's not how it works in nature. Rights are inherent to creation. 
And people have to understand that. They, as long as they don't understand that, they will never come to a correct understanding of natural law, and they will never understand how we are bound invariably according to universal moral law. Our behaviors are bound whether we like it or not, and we will receive the consequences of our behavior. There is no escape from that. And that is a universal present condition that exists in nature. It is not, does not come from man. So true anarchy is about understanding this is about no masters, no slaves, but it does not mean no rules. There will always be rules under natural law. It means no rulers. Those dissidents are my family, okay? And that's what we need a lot more of. The last section in the presentation today, deadly force. Very controversial territory. That which I haven't spoken on a great deal. Perhaps hinted at it, but not directly taken on this topic. We now arrive at a very controversial and disconcerting topic. When does one have the right to kill? To end by deadly force the life of another. Should that other refuse to stop initiating violence against their person or their rights? When does one possess the right to kill those who are holding them in a state of duress? To understand this or even consider the question, we have to understand the natural law distinction between force and violence. They are nothing alike. They are diametrically opposed opposites. Force is, in nature, the capacity to do work or, ca or cause physical change. Every single thing that you act upon to create any kind of change within your rights, you are conducting force. You are employing force. Force is synonymous scientifically with energy, strength, or active power being actively applied to something. And when it is within our natural rights, it is force. It is not coercion or violence. Force is action which exists in harmony with morality and natural law because the employment of it does not violate the rights of others. It is action which one always possesses the right to take, including defensive force employed against active violence being conducted upon yourself or your property or your rights. And that also includes the right to take defensive action against being held in a state of duress. It includes duress, meaning the threat of violence when, when you're not in compliance with another's coercive demands. You have the right to physically defend yourself in that instance. Violence, on the other hand, is the immoral use of physical power to coerce, compel, or restrain without right. There is no natural right to do this behavior. So violence, no one ever has the right to conduct. Violence is the initiation of coercive action which is in opposition to morality and natural law for the very reason that it violates the rights of others. That's where the word violence comes from. It comes from the, the root violation or violate. That's why it's called violence. Violence is action which one never possesses the right to take. It is always a wrongdoing to conduct violence upon another. That's the difference between force, especially defensive force, and violence. And people have to make that distinction philosophically. They have to understand it and be able to explain it. There is no such thing as the right to murder. Notice the word that I am using. There is no such thing as the right to murder. As a prescription against unjust killing, the fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament scripture does not actually translate as, quote, do not kill or thou shall not kill. That is not what the fifth commandment of the Torah, the Old Testament, says. Although that's the way it's popularly translated in almost every biblical translation. The fifth commandment in Hebrew is transliterated into English. There's the Hebrew characters, but in English it would be transliterated as lo tirzak. 
And lo tirzak means do not murder. Thou shall not commit murder, not thou shall not kill. There is a crucial difference between the two translations. To murder is to act outside of one's natural law rights with violence against the life of another, without right. When someone transgresses against our natural law rights through violence, we always possess the right to defend ourselves with whatever amount of force is required to stop the aggression, up to and including deadly force. The Bible and the Ten Commandments, you know, in historical, you know, traditional religious context, never says there is no time when you should not kill if you are doing it in a justified, true, right way when your rights and life and property are being violated by those who will not listen to reason and stop performing those behaviors. It says do not murder, which means you sh shouldn't conduct violence against another person's life by initiating coercive action and possibly deadly force action when you have no such right to do that. Clear and critical important distinction between those two modalities of behavior. And too few people understand them or are even comfortable with discussing the difference between killing and murder. You know, if it's truly immoral to ever kill, well, did the revolutionaries have the right to kill the British soldiers who were oppressing them? Did the Haitian slaves have a right to kill their slave owners? Of course they had the right. 100% had the natural right to perform those behaviors. You know, the people who were conducting murder upon these people, if they didn't obey their decrees and commands, had no such right. That's when it was immoral. To explore the original question further, let's consider the example of a kidnapping, which is a person being coercively taken against their will for nefarious reasons. When does the individual being kidnapped have the right to use defensive physical force, including deadly force, against the kidnappers? There is a correct answer to that question. And the correct answer, they have the right to use deadly force as soon as the act of duress begins. As soon as their free will has been usurped and they are being coerced and restrained from exercising their freedom and their free will. The answer is, immediately upon being put under the condition of duress. They have the right to employ deadly force. Once again, that doesn't mean that they would be necessarily successful and they may die in the attempt to repel the violence being conducted upon them. But in nature, they possess the right to kill the individual or group, putting them in that condition of duress. I'm making no promise about their safety. I'm trying to explain that the right exists. The psychological fear of self-defense and rebellion comes from a deeply seated fear of true freedom in this population. Absolutely. True freedom is uncharted territory for human beings, because we've never truly been free. Even if you want to argue shortly after the colonists performed the rebellion, which is the first true, real act of rebellion against tyrants in large numbers, we might have had share, you know, enjoyed a little bit of physical freedom for a very short period of time. And I mean it numbers in the years or less. Freedom is unexplored country. Hence, it is frightening to most people because most people fear the unknown. Moreover, people fear true freedom because true freedom implies and carries with it total personal responsibility which most human beings do not want and which most human beings will attempt to avoid at all costs. Most people are also very fearful of the types of sacrifice that be, may be necessary to gain real freedom. And I go back to the American revolutionaries. You want to talk about sacrifice. 
walking through ice at Valley Forge with no boots or shoes, tying ripped pieces of their uniforms like rags around their feet, blood trailing them as they walked to go fight. That's, that's the conditions they started the battle in. Imagine how they finished them. Less than 2,500 people left in the Revolutionary Army in freezing ice conditions in, in southern Pennsylvania and western New Jersey. And until they, I mean, you want to talk about having to really, really suck it up to get a job done. You know, on Christmas Day, crossing the Delaware to go and attack the British, which was an unheard of ta tactic. Be pre-dawn attack in, in blizzard-like conditions so that they had cover and weren't seen coming. They took on, they, they fought five times their numbers and it at least inflicted enough damage that they morally inspired other people to come and join the cause and other militias came and joined their cause. You wanna talk about sacrifice? We have no idea. None of us. I've talked on my podcast before of being at Valley Forge and feeling an energy like, uh, literally like a, a boulder on my chest because I know that I was there. I don't know how I know it, but I know it balls to bones that I was there, okay? Because I feel the energy in that place. I don't even ever wanna go back there ever again and I only live a few miles from it because of the, 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 the energetic vibration that I felt being present there almost made me physically ill. Every t almost every time I've been there, I felt it. If people won't fight for freedom, don't, please do not tell me that you love yourself or anyone else. See, because that's real love. People will say, oh, you gotta come more from the heart energy, you gotta go come more from a place of compassion. This is real love. Real love is telling people the harsh shit that no one else wants to tell them because you really love them at a soul level and they need to understand it. This is the condition of most human beings in the modern day. They're, they're in the schizoid state. They don't know who they are. They don't know, you know who they are or who the enemy is. And that's what's required to win any war, especially the spiritual war that we are in. You have to know yourself and you have to know the enemy. And most people know neither. And they're sitting in this state here on the right with the key to their very freedom in their hands. And you know what they're doing? They're, they're saying, who needs that? Slap it right out of there. Throw it at the person trying to give it to me. See, and that's what turning the other cheek really means. It doesn't mean forgive your oppressors endlessly. This notion of love your enemy. That's not what it means. Turning the other cheek and loving your enemy is not what that... These are false Christian notions. Real loving your enemy is loving those who are rejecting truth, even though they say that they want to be free. They're the real enemy because they're not getting it mentally and spiritually. They're not getting it mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. We have to keep turning the other cheek means you're bringing the truth to them. They're slapping it out of your hands while they're wearing shackles around their necks, ankles, and wrists and saying, there's a problem with you for telling me I need to understand freedom and what's keeping me enslaved. And then you know what you do? What real turning the other cheek is, you go pick up that key and you bring it back to them over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Please do not tell me, and again, I know that most people here in this room understand this, but the people listening out there, do not tell me, if you are unwilling to fight for your own freedom, please do not tell me that you love your children because you are an outright liar if you make that statement. No parent who is not concerned about freedom loves their children truly at its soul level, at a deep fundamental level. They don't even love themselves. How could they love their children? Once again, I use the example of my own grandmother on my father's side who will probably die in that condition of ignorance and an and enslaved mind because her ego is too calcified to admit her wrong, her wrong thoughts, feelings, and actions. 
would say, I know that the world is enslaved, I don't intend to do anything about it, and I don't care. To her grandson's face. You think that being can love anybody? Now, that being said, I'm not going to say I hate that person. They're destroyed at a soul level. That's a destroyed soul. I feel horrible for that person. I would never want to be in that condition, you know? You know, I hope the person is somehow able to be reformed, but it would take a literal, a literally an act of God. Literally. Now, I don't have the power to transform a human being in that condition. I don't have that power or ability and would never claim that I have it. You know, I, I'm not that powerful. You know, that will take something that is infinitely more powerful than someone like me. But people have to, you know, admit the truth that if, if you're not, if you don't take an active stand for truth and freedom, don't tell me you love the generations that come after us, including your own biological children, because you don't. The people who are unwilling to fight for freedom, the state worshipers, the state enforcer thugs who follow their orders, the order followers, the house slaves, the pacifists. This is a big one for me. I talked about them. I had a whole section in Fake Ass Christians, which, by the way, I'm going to be releasing Fake Ass Christians publicly for free on Easter Sunday. I figured that's an appropriate day. <laughs> so look for that on my website and YouTube on Easter Sunday. I release all my public material for free, but I, I, you know, reserve it, you know, for early adopters in my gifts area to, you know, get some donations in to help pay for the technology I need for a couple months after they, they publicly come out, they, they, after I actually have the video in my hands, uh, whether I edit it or I have help editing it from a, another editor. And then I release them for free after that. So all, all of my info is always for free on my website except the very last presentation that I did. Like I said, I put it out on DVD and flash drive for a couple months, then I release it for free. So, uh, pacifists, so oh, boy, oh boy, you wanna talk, I mean, you wanna talk about complicit with evil, you know? These are people who would say, there's never a time to physically defend yourself. I mean, how could, that, that's a pure state of self-loathing, pure state of self-loathing. Self-defense is one of the two pillars of enlightenment. You have to understand non-aggression. The non-aggression principle is the sacred feminine dynamic, but then you have to step into the masculine energy of the self-defense principle. And you have to be willing to defend your rights and your life and your freedom. So pacifists are unwilling to do that. Defeatists, oh, we can't win. The government's too powerful. Yeah, the people say, what do you need an AR-15 for or an AK-47? You know, you can't defeat the modern military. Thank you. You can't defeat the modern military with that mindset. Don't speak for me. I'll take my chances with my AK. Okay? And, and I may die trying, but that means I died standing up to evil who's conducting duress without any right to do so. And I would gladly do that and follow in the footsteps of people who actually did that. Because they did what was right, not what was safe. How much more time do I have or am I already over? Okay, Couple, a few more minutes. I'm in the last section. I just want to know how much time left, but okay. The nihilists, those who don't care about anything, the traditional religionists and new age religionists that take this super right-brained approach that, oh, it's all, you know, God's will or all peace and love and roses and love and light. No, there's psychopaths and monsters in this world that we need to be prepared to defend ourselves against. The left brain, egg-headed, ultra-skeptics, you know, the people who, oh, they're super skeptical about everything. Look, I have a scientific background. I consider myself a skeptic. But when you're so overly into the left brain modality, that's just as bad as a radical religionist, that you won't accept anything that's taking place right in front of you. You say, oh, that's conspiratorial. No, that's what's really happening, you know? Yeah, they'll look at it, they'll look at a chemtrail being laid down at 8,000 feet, which condensation conditions can't even form at scientifically. You know, they know nothing about thermodynamics and fluid mechanics. And then they're going to say, yeah, that's water vapor that lingers up there for six hours. Yeah, it's not particulate matter. 
and you say you're an ultra skeptic and a science, you have a scientific mind. All of these people have one thing ultimately in common. They would never lift a finger to defend true freedom because all of them ultimately are cowards without the slightest bit of true courage. They're cowards. Cowards. And folks, that's a dynamic I also don't have the power to change because that is internal spiritual work to develop true courage that needs to be done on an individual basis where you develop enough self-love to say, I will not be stepped upon. I will not be enslaved. You will not take my rights without consequence. You may be able to take my life, but you're not gonna take my rights without consequence. And if I have to inflict that consequence, I'll do it. Maybe you'll face consequences in the after, life domain, if should there be such a place, but I'll make sure you face them in the physical world too. Because I'm not going down without a physical fight if I have to. Real freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. Most people love the comfort of their lives more than they love freedom itself. But possessions, jobs, homes mean nothing and are not worth quote unquote having when you are a slave. Because when you are a slave, you don't really have anything. Nothing is of any real value if you are a slave. The idea that what you have is worth anything in a state of slavery is a delusion which must be dispelled in order to overcome the cowardice of inaction and to develop the courage of a true dissident. You know, speaking of the Black Panther movie that Ivan took me to see last night, you know, there was a scene at the end, the, the, the truth comes through the mouth of the villains in these movies. That's Hollywood's technique to try to get you to think, oh, what he said was all wrong when he mixes in truth with his psychopathic behavior. Very good psyop technique that they use in Hollywood. But the villain says at the end when he, he's finally defeated by the hero with a spear to the chest, he tells him, we have the technology to save you. And he says, for what? so that you can imprison me, you know? And he pulls the spear, he, before he pulls the spear out of his chest and dies, he says, no, that's okay. I'll take the path that my ancestors who leapt off the boats in the mid-Atlantic took because they recognized that death was better than bondage. And then he takes the spear out of his chest and dies. Now, I would certainly argue with the approach that he took in the movie because he wanted to become the new king and oppressor. But they're putting words in his mouth that are absolutely true to get people not to understand them as being true because the villain spoke them, you know? Big technique going on in Hollywood right now. There will never be true freedom here on earth unless and until that level of courage is developed within the human population. We already, quote unquote, have nothing left to lose. We have to say the lost word, no. There has to be a line in the sand where we say this far and no further. And let me tell you what my line in the sand is. When speech is curtailed or weapon, weaponry is begun to be removed or confiscated. Those are my lines in the sand. Because one makes my physical defense impossible and one makes the communication of truth impossible. And we're seeing the first and they're trying to get the second one done, but we're seeing the curtailing of free speech and censorship happening in this country that's supposed to be a land where free speech rights are protected. Because when the last word is not, the lost word is not accepted and people will not back down when they're told, no, you may not come for my rights anymore. We have one recourse left and I call that the last word. And let me tell you something, it's a loud, loud, loud word when it's spoken. It's going to be heard to the far ends of the solar system. And it's no joke and no game. You should look on YouTube at war footage and see what bullets do to the human body and what bombs do to the human body. You should psychologically watch it and understand it well. 
because it ain't like it's depicted in Hollywood movies, folks, at all, at all. And that's going to come. This is going to come to America if we are not careful in how we proceed. And a big, big, big shouldering of responsibility comes directly down on the people who do understand this information that I'm presenting. Because if we shirk our responsibility to teach this widely and freely to as many people as we can reach, we're going to be complicit in what's going to happen. George Washington said, when any nation mistrusts its citizens with guns, it is sending a clear message. It no longer trusts its citizens because such a government has evil plans. Thomas Paine said, arms discourage and keep the invader and plunderer in awe and preserve order in the world as well as prosperity. Horrid mischief would ensue were the law abiding deprived the use of firearms. The Founding Fathers of America explaining why it is necessary to have an AR-15 if the police and military have them. They knew and tried to tell us. See, this phrase is something I want to put out there more to help people to understand. Ultima ratio populi. It's Latin. It means the last reason of the people or as I like to refer to it, the last word. This is the, the, the final say and the final explaining of our rights to those who are oppressors and people who hold us in the condition of duress and slavery. And I do not want to see it have to come down to that, but if it does, just like the revolutionaries of America, I'll take that eventuality if I have to, because it will allow for the future preservation of the understanding of rights and freedom. That's, that was the blood sacrifice that the founders and revolutionaries did for this nation. Because without them doing that, the idea of true freedom could have been buried and gone from the earth. It was preserved here in a deeper fashion than it ever has been anywhere else in the world, which has allowed someone's understanding like myself to flourish and grow about what real freedom is because of the words they wrote and how they were preserved and how other teachings of many other brilliant men and women were preserved as well. That's what the role of real education is and that's why conscious parenting is so important to teach the young moral principles. But see that's going to become harder and harder as they ramp up censorship efforts and this is a very very dangerous proposition for them doing this and then advancing these gun control agendas in conjunction with the censorship. Now they're, they're trying to control the very narrative. They're trying to control our ability to explain the reality of the situation to others. And they have no right to do this. People will argue, oh, they're a private corporation, they have every right to control this, that, that, and the other thing. No, they're acting as a public service and they're allowing the propagation of one side of the story without allowing the propagation of all sides of the story. Whether the person's right or wrong, they have the freedom of speech to put their take out on online. And YouTube and Google and these other evil corporations that are trying to control the internet are doing something that is going to lead to war. It's going to lead to war. Traitors. Yeah, they're absolute traitors to this country and its people. Absolute traitors. Because as John F. Kennedy said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. And I would say self-defensive revolution will become inevitable, not violent. That's the only word he got wrong in that sentence. Yeah. Yep. And they're trying to make the peaceful mode of, of resistance to tyranny and the education of the population impossible. And when that happens, and we can't say the lost word, we're going to break out the last word. Let me tell you something. You think I'm a rebellious spirit about that? I've said before, I'm tame compared to the barbarians that exist here in America with guns. Let me tell you something. They'll fight with the barbarity of a, a legion of demons. They don't understand the force, the can of worms they're going to open up in this country. It's going to be, they want this blood ritual sacrifice conducted upon our own people. They want it. They want it and they're going to get it 
If we don't step up the effort to teach true morality to the people of this country, they're going to get what they want. Because as I've said before, only one side of a dialectic needs to really buy into the dialectic for the dialectic to be successful. Examples to follow, Jesus, the founding fathers and revolutionaries of early America, the black slaves of early America who fought back against their enslavers, and the anarchists of today are dissidents that embody that spiritual truth of the illegitimacy of rulership and the spirit of true freedom. We must first, we have to do the great work of first liberating our own minds from erroneous belief systems and see through the illusions that are keeping us all in a state of bondage. We must then begin the arduous task of educating others to help them to understand the principles of true morality and freedom under natural law. Because true freedom begins in the mind. And without an understanding philosophically in the mind of natural law, no true freedom will ever be found. We have to prepare for the worst. We need to recognize that deadly force may be required and cannot be taken off the table as a possible resort because the people who perpetuate violence and slavery and those who ideologically support them erroneously believe that they somehow have the right to perpetuate, perpetuate this state of duress upon us and they may never be willing to back down from these continued extreme violations of natural law. As I said before, there are Monsters and demons in this world, folks. The spiritually destroyed may not be willing to back down. The employment of deadly force is a rightful response to the evil of slavery that we must maintain the ability to enact if necessary. And that is why semi-automatic weaponry is necessary. If there must be trouble in my day, if there must be trouble, let it be in my day that my child may have peace. Thomas Paine. Freedom is never given, it is won. Thomas Paine also said, those who expect to reap the blessings of freedom must, like men, undergo the fatigues of supporting it. I would say much like all people should undergo the fatigue of defending and supporting freedom as Samuel Adams, quote, earlier said. Resistance is victory. This idea of resist not evil, not a Christian notion and it's got to go. Of course we should be resisting evil and tyranny. That's what our lives, our very lives should be dedicated to that. Only 3% of the colonists actually fought and won the Revolutionary War. That's what the three means. I don't, don't think I'm identifying with any particular group. It's like saying, oh, you put a cross up, well, that's identifying with this particular religious sect. No. It, me it simply means the 3% of the American revolutionaries who actually picked up arms and fought physically against their British tyrannical oppressors. And they got the job done. Namely because they were the British were waging a war over an ocean. They were the people, yes, yep, the last slide is the next slide. They were the people like you and me, they were people like you and me that said no. If they came to these understandings and acted rightly upon them, so can we. Freedom is the highest spiritual truth. Fighting to defend it mentally and physically is our natural, inherent human birthright. Resistance to the evil of human slavery is not futile. It is the path to true spiritual alignment with the very laws of creation itself. Freedom is not a gift bestowed on us by other men, but a right that belongs to us by the laws of God and nature. Benjamin Franklin. Resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. Thomas Jefferson. It all comes down to liberty or death, folks. They're not just words. There are choices. Life on earth is not truly worth continuing if we are enslaved. This is what the phrase liberty or death actually means. Liberty or death are the only options. There is no middle ground. The truth regarding our situation is extreme. We must take an extreme position regarding our rights and our freedom and firmly root ourselves in that truth. Freedom is the gift and will of creation. When we rise to the defense of freedom, universal forces of providence will come to our aid. 
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your kind attention.